One of the things that I struggle with, coveting, my, how I'm perceived by people is very important to me. Um, I want to be seen as successful. I want to be seen as a person of influence. I want to be seen as somebody of significance. We all do at some level, but this is, this is, my, this is my issue. So, after I got out of the Marines, I'd had a pretty successful run with ministry. I mean, we had had some really awesome God times with certain fellowships we had been with, and they move you around from group to group. Some places were better than others, more exciting, more spiritually fervent, but all generally were very successful ministry efforts. So I get out, and I, through a series of so some prayer and, and asking God what to do, he leads me to go to finish my undergraduate degree at a local Bible college. And so I go there, and I plug into this church. It's a great church in the Detroit area called Kensington Community Church. Um, it's where Julie and I met. It had an incredible ministry to young adults, 20s and 30s, uh, that I became a part of. And then there was this speaker. I won't use his last name, but I will use his first name. His first name is Steve. And Steve could preach. Steve was a very gifted communicator. Now, I didn't necessarily think Steve, when I tried to have conversation with him, was all that thoughtful towards me, felt like he kind of brushed me off a little bit. I wanted to be a part, I wanted to, but Steve could preach the word of God. And the combination of these two things and the fact that there I am sitting in the audience where you are, pursuing possibly a ministry degree, seeing him up there doing what I'm doing now, caused a very strong root of sinful desire to take hold in my heart. And I could not see Steve preach without feeling a sense of envy, anger, rivalry. I mean, it was deep. And it wasn't just Steve. It was me. It was my issue. It was my struggle. It was my need. Well, certain things happened in the ministry, and there was a big leadership change. And all of a sudden, there's this, there's this opening for who's going to be the new leader. They restructure some things, and they're looking more of a volunteer effort, and, and I've been serving and shown myself faithful. And all of a sudden, there's this opportunity to get up and to serve. And there's four of us on this team, me and this guy named Chris and this woman, Kim, and this other woman, Elspeth. There's the four of us, and they're going to pick a leader. And I've been the Christian the longest. Um, I'm the best speaker. I know that. Um, I figured this out in my mind. I'm the youngest, but, you know, in my economy, I figured this all out. And the previous leader who's moving on makes the decision. I remember the phone call, and he comes and he says, yeah, um, we've decided, and I just want to let you know, we've, uh, I've chosen and asked Chris to take over leadership of the ministry. I'm like, Chris? What? Don't you know him? Don't you know how young he is in his faith? Sure, he might be an engineer at Chrysler, and he might be, he might be you know, able to have a lot more world experience and be able to navigate the, the challenges and the dangers of growing a ministry, but I really think I, I have it. I really think I'm the one. And God confirmed in me that, no, Jeremy, I want Chris. And I want Chris and his failures because I want you to ultimately want something different than simply to be the guy with the microphone talking to people. It was my area of covet, coveting, of covetousness. I had a calling to ministry when I was 17 years old, I felt. God didn't give me a microphone on a platform for more than 12, for over 12 people for nine years. It wasn't until I was 26 that I stood before any number of people with the authority and the ability to speak. Coveting is an incredibly serious and important issue in our heart that God wants to address. What is it for you? Is it your marriage? Are you not happy with the marriage that you have, wanting another marriage, wanting somebody else? Is it the fact that you're not married? Does that trouble you? Are you constantly looking for someone to be married to? Are you missing out on the moment, the here and the now? It's not in my script, but I want to take this moment. Our own Hudson Davis recently was published. I believe the name of the book is Content But Not Satisfied about the life of a single, of the life of the single journey from singleness towards marriage. I recommend it. You can get it on Amazon. It's really cool when you see your friend's book is on Amazon and you can order it. Um, 
But are you, are you single? Are you wanting something different than where you're at? Is it your job? Have you been continually wanting something that is not yours and never finding the ability to be where you need to be in that moment? It could be where you live. House is getting small. It could be the church you're in. The church is getting small. Matt was just up here asking us to look within our heart. What are our motivations? What is going on in the nature of our heart towards that thing that we want that we don't currently possess? Coveting is a strong, it's a powerful, powerful sin. It will drive us to many things that can ultimately destroy us, our families, our lives. So what do we do? Well, I have three things that I think are great in combating coveting. The first is to be a person of gratitude, to be grateful. The church, as it was known, maybe I don't know so much about these days, but the church for centuries was known, it was set apart, it was distinct, because regardless of the persecution, the hardship, the injustice that Christians endured for centuries... For 2,000 years, the people of God were known for their grateful hearts. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Gratefulness. How do you combat coveting? How do you combat wanting something? This, the, the, the feelings that go with coveting, the dangers? Practice a great, being a grateful person and having a grateful heart. My wife has recently... Uh, she's been following a blogger uh, for some time who recently wrote a book called uh, A Thousand Gifts. What's the name of the blogger? Ann Voskamp. And her book is called A Thousand Gifts. And in her book, she challenges women or any reader, it's predominantly for women, but anybody who would read, to record every day a thousand things and keep adding to the list up to a thousand of things you are thankful for because of the power of being thankful, because of the power of realizing What I have has truly been a gift from God. The grass is always what? It's always greener. Always greener. It's only not greener if we are thankful for the grass that we have. And if we are daily thanking God for the grass that we have. Weeds and all. Bare spots and all. I got seven kinds of grass that were grown in my back acre. It's it's annoying as can be. I look at the neighbors, it truly is greener. It's beautiful. His acre is much nicer than mine. I want to ask if the boys can go over there and play. No, my acre is a gift from God, and it's good. It is good. The second thing, to fight this desire and this temptation to covet is a spirit of contentment, which comes out of a grateful heart. Contentment will come out of a grateful heart, okay? In 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, there's a verse that says, Contentment with godliness, or godliness with contentment is what? It's great gain. It is to your advantage. It is to your positive. It is to your benefit. It is to your growth. It is to your well-being to be grateful, to be content, and to live godly. That does something in us that God is equating as benefit, as progress, as growth. Not getting something we don't have, but godliness with what we already have is the process by which we gain. Here's the problem, though. We live in a world that is unrelenting in its marketing efforts to convince you and I that we are what? Discontent. Everything we see, billboards, TV, radio, our our economy, this consumerism economy, which you hear all the time, we need to spend more money, we need more retail sales, we need to spend, whether we have the money or not, and we need to buy and we need to consume so that we can keep our economy and get it back going. It's ridiculous. Now, I'm not saying there's not a certain role we play in the economy, but consumers, corporations spend billions of dollars a year trying to convince you and me that we're not happy with what we have. We always need something more. We always need the next thing. We always need the bigger thing. We need to hold on to the big thing that we have. We need to wash the big thing that we have every week, and if someone bumps up against it or actually touches it with their door at the, at the uh, shopping center, we, go, we freak out. What are you doing? We get caught up in this, 
it's, it's, I wonder if previous cultures could have ever imagined the bombardment that we face towards discontentment and needing something more than what we have. It's not okay to be content. Strive more, get more, do more. But it's not just the marketing. Let's take our children, for example. Jonathan, come on in. He's out playing. Call Jonathan. And this didn't really happen, but if it did, you can play it out. Jonathan, come on in. I have a scoop of chocolate ice cream to give you. And I get a bowl out, and I give him a scoop of chocolate ice cream, and I give it to him, and I give him a spoon. Not any of the other brothers and sisters, just Jonathan. What is Jonathan thinking? How's he feeling? Loving life. He's like, wow, I am special. This is amazing. Papa never does this. This is awesome. What if I call in David? I give David a bowl, and I give David a scoop. Oh, and then I give David another scoop. What immediately happens to Jonathan? My scoop isn't any good anymore. I got two, what, but I can... And it's not David and Jonathan. It's all of us. That's you and that's me. That's the reality. It takes a second scoop of ice cream is all it takes to make you and I ungrateful and discontented with what God has given us. Is that not pathetic? Another illustration of some pathetic behavior. In the Marines, they deprive you of all things sugary and good and fun. And so <laughs> your, your parents are sending you boxes of the stuff, but the drill instructors, they're supposed to give it to you, but they always kind of fudge the rules a little bit, at least when I was in, in the old core, sorry, um, they, would, they wouldn't necessarily give it to you. Um, and then one day, one of the Marines said, uh, said to the drill instructor who had gotten a box, and he knew it was a big box of candy, and he said to him, he goes, uh, excuse me, uh, senior drill instructor, but um, aren't we supposed to be given the boxes that we were sent to us? He paid for it on the quarter deck doing uh, jumping jacks and push-ups for some time, but he was right. And the drill instructor said he knew he was cornered. He'd been called out. He knew he couldn't not give it to us. He'd break the rules. So he rips open this box of candy, and he just throws it down the squad bay. Now... It's cheap, ridiculous candy. And there's 66 men sitting on two rows on this side. To my credit, in this instance at least, I was one of six that was not crawling on the floor, groveling, wrestling like a bunch of four-year-olds at a, at a pinata party that had just gone. <laughs> Grown men. Why? Because they wanted something they didn't have. The spirit of covetousness does not leave when we get older. It stays. The third thing for you, for us in this, and it's the best thing, I think, because the others are, well, I need to be thankful and I need to be content. But this third is really, I think, the key. It's the most ethereal and hardest one to wrap your brain around. But if you can, if you can wrap your brain around this, if you can understand this, if you can go after this third one, There truly is success in the battle, not just against coveting, but against everything. And that is to desire Jesus more. Don't just spend your life trying to withhold. Remember I talked about desire? Don't spend your life being a Buddhist and trying not to desire and suppress your desire. Acknowledge we're human, we're going to desire, but desire Jesus more. You want something? Want Jesus more. You want the car, want the ability to, to love and, and honor and, and be, be thankful for what you have more. Want the fullness of what God might have for you with the current vehicle that you have. You want a different f- spouse, maybe different children. Want the reality of being an agent of Jesus in their lives. Don't think, I got to get rid of this family. How did I end up with this? Be the Jesus to them. Pursue God and the heart of Jesus that he can give it to you and ultimately allow you to be the salvation that they need. Don't get caught up in the idea that something's ever going to be better. 